to church? Well, I hope you, um, I hope you've all had a good week, and um, it feels like spring is here, right? The flowers are out. I was at Heritage College. Man, the school looks so good right now. And you drive in, there's just beautiful flowers everywhere. Um, having said all that, it it's, hasn't been the greatest week news-wise for me personally, and maybe for some of you as well. Um, as Anna mentioned in prayer, um, she mentioned the Butov family. Uh, young Alex has been in an accident, and the family asks for your prayers. Had a good chat with Paul uh, this week, and it's been really hard. Um, hard news. Uh, last Sabbath after church, I quickly rushed off, ate lunch, went to Lilydale Church, where I got to be a part of a baptism for a student that I'd journeyed with for many years. And um, during the baptism, I got a uh, a call with some of my pastoral colleagues to say that one of our pastoral team had lost his wife that same day. I had baptized his son. And so it was really rough. And then only Wednesday, I got a call from one of my closest friends from high school. Um, uh, he was one of my groomsmen, and he said, Ryan, um, Eric, one of our friends, he knows you're a man of God. Can you pray for him? Why? What's happening? His wife's just been in a car accident, as in a coma. It's been a really rough week. And in weeks like these, or moments like these, it just brings you to a really low place. You familiar with that? We just have these moments in life where things happen, maybe incidents like the ones that have happened this week, maybe there are things connected to our work, our family, circumstances of life bring us to places where we just feel low and vulnerable and a bit of a mess, and you don't always know what God is doing. I share all of that by way of introduction because today I want to look at the quality of encouragement. As you know, we're journeying through Acts. If you're new with us, welcome Welcome, good friends. There's some good friends in the front row over here. Welcome to Pakenham. Um, but we've been journeying through the book of Acts. And today we are continuing on that journey and we're looking in chapter 11 to see how the church continues to go. And we're only focusing on a very small passage of Scripture. And I thought there was real value in sort of digging deep into what's going on here in Acts chapter 11 and we'll be really basing ourselves between verses 19 and 30. Last week, we saw the Holy Spirit come down in power to a group of Romans based in Caesarea. And it's absolutely shocking. I dare say it's scandalous for the early church, who at this point is primarily made up of Jewish converts to Christianity. We saw that God was sort of shifting, he was stretching people's paradigms to think that the Jesus movement was more than an ethnic movement, it was an international movement. One where people will be invited in from different races, from different creeds, from different backgrounds. And this is a tough pill to swallow. Now this week, the same sort of activity takes place independently of last week's story, it, the same things start to happen in the city of Antioch. Antioch is a very special place. It's on the coins. If you were to live in Antioch and you, you exchanged money as a citizen of the city, on the coin you'd read this, Antioch, metropolis, sacred and invi invi inviolable, and autonomous and sovereign and capital of the East. Antioch is a very self-important city, and where we've seen Jesus show up in little pockets of Gentiles here and there, <clears throat> we're going to see him move in a very powerful way in a major metropolis, in a major city. 
The city of Antioch had come a long way. Here's a little bit of history. It had come a long way since its founding by Seleucus I in about 300 BC, who named it after his father Antiochus. Jews had played a very significant part in this city from its earliest days, and there was a considerable and well-established Jewish community in Antioch in the middle of the first century. So, in a revealing remark, Josephus tells us that proselytes to Judaism were especially abundant in this city. So, there's a very big Jewish scene in this city, but there's also a very large community of Jew, of people who've become Jewish, Gentiles. Some other little interesting things about the city of Antioch is that many of the persecuted Christians from Jerusalem would find themselves in Antioch. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire of about 500,000 people, the largest being Rome, followed by the city of Alexandria. Now, 500,000 people is about the size of the city of Canberra today. Canberra actually is 450,000 people. So I just want you to think how big this city is. As I've mentioned, there's a very large Jewish community there, as well as many other nations. It's a very cosmopolitan place. And you would think, you, you start to hear the word Antioch as a Jewish reader, a Jewish convert, you'd be like, okay, I know what's happening now. These converts to Christianity, people of the way, these Jewish people, they've gone to Antioch and they're going to reach out to our family. That's exactly what's going to happen. And what we find out in this story is actually God's going to do a powerful work, but not in the way that the people were expecting. God is once again going to subvert the people's expectations of what ministry looks like and who his target audience will be. And friends, I think sometimes we have a sense of who we are meant to be targeting, but God has other plans. And the question is, will we be ready when he goes, okay, I th you, you thought you were going to zig, but I actually need you to zag right now. Will we be ready when he invites us to zag to our zig? Does that make sense? Is that too much of a tongue tie? Okay, you're following me, right? So we have all of these Jewish Christians that are like, okay, we're going to reach out to these people. So let's actually see what took place in this city and what can we learn about ministry? What can we learn about reaching people for Jesus as we journey through this story? So we pick up our, in our story in verse 19. Verse 19 reads, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus. So these are some, uh, Cyprus is an island, Phoenicia is a coastal place, and Antioch. And they were speaking the word to no one except Jews. So the story of Cornelius and Peter has not reached these people. They are still very much in the, this is how we do ministry. This is how it's meant to be. So they're sharing with Jews. This is what they thought was normal. But Luke wants to show us that God is up to something different. So in verse 20, we read, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. They spoke to native Greek speakers. And they were preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Just remember, this is very independent of the, of the story that we've just seen last week. And what we find out is a great number who believed turned to the Lord. What you need to know about Jewish Christians, this is something I've learned, I didn't realize this until this sermon series, you have your, you've got Jews who live in the vicinity of Jerusalem, you've got your Pharisees, your Sadducees, your Essenes, but when you go beyond, when you go to the Jewish diaspora, the Jews who have spread out throughout the Roman Empire, I mean, what type of Jew you will encounter from one place to the next could be very different. In one place, you'll find a group of Jews who are so strict about keeping their distance from Gentiles. But in another place, you'll find a group of Jews um, who, are, who are very lax 
and their values, I mean, maybe they don't eat pork, but that's as Jewish as they get. You know what I'm talking about? And here we have a group of Jews who are reaching Gentiles, and it didn't seem to be a problem to them, where it was a problem for the Jews in Jerusalem. Do you see that? There's kind of not, there's not one standard approach to seeing the world. But in spite of their, their sort of ignorance on the broader Jewish family, these Jewish Christians were reaching Greeks. They were Greek speakers. They were from the island of Cyprus. I have a good friend, Christos Spiro. He's a Cypriot. He loves being Cypriot. He's from Cyprus. And, and it's like these Jewish people would reach my friend Christos. Something just, this, this was not normal. Now, now, word gets out about this, and the church in Jerusalem's like, we need to find out what's going on. We need to do an investigation. And, and last week, I shared a challenging sermon. Sometimes God's going to invite us into new places, right? He's going to stretch us. He's going to take us into environments that maybe make us feel uncomfortable. But here's what the church does. It does its due diligence. The church does an investigation. I won't say a witch hunt. Sometimes churches do witch hunts, but this is an investigation, right? In Acts chapter 8, when the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit, there's an investigation. A group of people go. In Acts chapter 11, we looked last week. Peter's talking to Cornelius. The Holy Spirit comes down in power. The church investigates. This week, we see an Antioch. The Holy Spirit is moving. People are coming to Jesus. The church investigates. Here's a little quote from a man called Larry Hurtado, a theologian. The spread of Christianity among the Gentiles required the early church to confront and redefine its identity, its practices, as well as its relationship to the wider world. This was a critical investigation that shaped the future of the Christian movement and faith. I've shared with you last week to go, if Jesus is leading, we've got to take some bold steps, but let's just make sure Jesus is leading, right? Please don't hear me last week as being irresponsible, but if God's leading, let's just make sure he really, in fact, is leading. Because maybe if he is, in fact, leading, it might redefine how we do ministry in these last days, right? Adventist history is full of moments like this. And I don't have time to get into all of this, but if you want to know a little bit about the origins of our denomination, please, you can do this right now if you want, if you forget, look up a podcast called the Adventist History Podcast. It's a great podcast. It goes from the inception of the Adventist Church all the way up till kind of modern times, I think, is the, the idea. It's been a really good podcast. And as I've been listening to it over these past three few years, you start to realize the, the, ad, the birth of the Adventist church is very much like the birth of the church in Acts. It, there is God moving through a core group of people, but he's also moving on the edges. He's moving on the edges of what this core group's doing. And when the core group finds out, like, okay, we have to go check this out. We have to see what's happening. And a group of, uh, will go and check what's going on. And they're like, okay, God's doing something, but these people need teaching. These people need to be consolidated in the narrative of Scripture. And so a group of people are sent to help new believers grow. I mean, it's, it's almost like a mirror experience. It's so fascinating to watch. So please check it out, the Adventist History Podcast. If you want to know a little bit more about Adventists and where they come from, I'd really encourage you to check this podcast out. So like I said, an investigation is going to happen, and let's pick up in verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. He is going to be the investigator. Verse 23. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. First question I have when I read this is, okay, how do you see, in verse 23, the grace of God? That's 
you got this guy, Barnabas, he's come from Jerusalem, he gets to this community, he goes, I see the grace of God. There's something about the experience of this church in a foreign city which is made up of Jews and Gentiles. He's like, God's grace is working in this place, right? Now, this is an invisible attribute, right? Can you see tangibly the grace of God? No, this is kind of a concept. He is seeing something being enacted here. He's seeing the effects of grace. Remember when Jesus said, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to come, and it's like the wind. You don't know where the wind's coming from, but you're going to see it blowing on things. You're going to see it moving on things. Barnabas was able to have, the, have this state of mind where he could see the effects of the Spirit moving across this fledgling church. And I mean, it's kind of a superpower, I feel, just to be able to see that. Not everybody in the book of Acts has this quality or ability. Barnabas does. I, I found this little line and it really resonated with me. Barnabas had seen God reaching out with, without a human cause, without humans deserving. He sees God's kindness at work. He sees people being transformed. He sees joy. He sees deliverance. He sees purpose. These are the things he's seeing in Antioch. And Jesus talked that there was going to come a time, in fact, where the rest of the world would one day be able to receive and be receptive to his message. Andrew, it, the, we're back in, in, in Judea, Andrew is talking to a group of Greeks and they wanna, they've been listening to Jesus and they want to meet him and, and Jesus addresses them very publicly and everybody who's listening, he said in John chapter 12 and verse 30 to 32, they're, they're, everybody hears this voice from heaven. This voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus is saying there was going to come a time when he was going to put the ruler of this world on notice. He's going to get kicked out and he is going to be able to now do effective ministry with the rest of the world, once he is lifted high. That moment had come powerfully, and now it's being in, lived in the lives of the people in the city of Antioch. Barnabas could see this. So who is Barnabas? We, we've read his name. I've glossed over it because I knew we were getting to this place where I wanted to go in a little bit more detail who is this man Barnabas? In verse 24 of our passage, Acts 11, we are told he is a good man. Now, guys, this is a big deal because Luke does not call anybody good except for Barnabas in the book of Acts. The only other person called good by Luke is in his biography about Jesus, and he calls Joseph of Arimathea the man who carries the cross, he is the only other person in all of Luke's writings that are called good. Luke wants you to know this guy is special. This guy is different. He is full of the Spirit, and he is able to discern what's going on, the movements of God. In Acts chapter 4, we actually find out that Barnabas is not his name. His name's actually Joseph, which means may God add. And wouldn't you see God do that powerfully in Joseph of Genesis, right? God would add, you know, he would increase, um, you know, the family of Israel as this famine comes through. And, and Egypt would have this abundance of, of food for seven years in order to serve the people to seven years of, of famine. And so Barnabas, a.k.a. Joseph, we're going to see him through or God through him, God is going to add powerfully. He's called Barnabas in that same chapter in Acts chapter 4 because all of the disciples and apostles are like, this guy's pretty cool. And so Barnabas literally means a son of encouragement or, or, encouragement or a son of exhortation, which literally I was like, well, let's just make sure we're clear on exhortation 
Literally, the dictionary says strong encouragement. <laughs> so he's either the son of encouragement or the son of strong encouragement. And it's not just general encouragement, but it's encouraging, it's pushing people in a very strong way towards the person of Jesus. We have to see it in context. He's a Cypriot. He comes from the island of Cyprus, but he's also a Levite. And, and that's a rare combination because the people in Jerusalem, the Jews in Jerusalem, they're a little bit suspect of, of Greek Jews, but because Barnabas is a Levite, he actually, his family gets more involved in worship in a deeper level. So he's a part of the in crowd. He's a part of the out crowd and the in crowd. So it puts him in a very unique situation. He's a, he's a unique type of character. We also know that he's generous. He sells a plot of land that he has on the island of Cyprus, gives the money to the church. He's so convicted that this is the right thing to do. And meanwhile, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira, who also sell a block of land, but decide to keep some of the proceeds, right? And we know how that story ends. I mean, this guy is generous, but he's also somebody who is really good at encouraging when nobody else in the church in Jerusalem would welcome Paul, the new convert, the convert who had once killed their friends and family, Barnabas is the person who comes to the front of the church and says, hey, you're welcome here. We need Barnabases, and this is the whole point of my sermon today. We need Barnabases in our church today. Where would we be if it wasn't for Barnabas extending the hand of friendship to the Apostle Paul? I have lots of quotes today. Here's another one. Barnabas' ability to discern the grace of God at work in others gave him a generous and encouraging spirit. This enabled him to facilitate the ministry of Saul or Paul in Jerusalem when others were suspicious of his intentions. When John Mark had previously abandoned his missionary partners, Barnabas would show up in faith. Guys, I don't think we have the New Testament the way we have it without the person of Barnabas. We don't have this character. I, I, I'm a bit of an NBA fan, and maybe some of you guys were. I'm a 90s NBA fan. I loved the Jordan era. I had a Chicago Bulls hat. Anybody had their Chicago Bulls hat? Yeah, yeah. All right. We, you know, I, I, and so when that documentary came out, The Last Dance, I was all there for it to watch the story of Michael Jordan. And it was just great. Emma was not into the NBA. She's like, got Macy somewhere. And I was just explaining to her all of my childhood. I remember this guy and that guy. And what you see is that you really don't have a Michael Jordan without a Scottie Pippen. The sports people know the reference, <laughs> okay? As good as Michael Jordan is, and his name is on everybody's lip, he's still put in the conversations, is he the greatest, is LeBron the greatest? You don't put Michael Jordan, I believe, in my opinion, in the greatest basketball player of all time if you don't have a, a supporting act like Scottie Pippen. You just don't have it. You don't have a transformed, turned upside down Mediterranean world if you don't have a Barnabas speaking exhortation into the person of Paul. You just don't have it. And I wonder, do we have a Seventh-day Adventist movement without people exhorting, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ to take the next step in ministry? I just don't know if we have people accomplishing the purposes of Jesus before he comes without the quality of encouragement. This is from A.W. Tozer. Christian exhortation is the lifeblood of the body of Christ. Have you ever thought of that? Christian exhortation. I want to push my brothers and sisters in Christ lovingly towards Jesus. This is the lifeblood of the body of Christ in his opinion. Without this, the church becomes a cold, loveless community. Has anybody been in one of those? 
a place where there is no exhortation, there is no love. We're not pushing each other towards Jesus to higher heights, but we're just stamping each other down like my daughter is at children's story time, stamping on the stage. Is, oh, oh, have you been to a church like that? I haven't encountered this at Packham, just so you know. But, but we've all been to churches like this, right? It's horrible. Who wants to be a part of a faith community like that? A.W. Tozer says, exhortation is so important. And, and when we have exhortation with it, the church is a warm and vibrant fellowship, spurring one another on in faith. Friends, exhortation is so important, and yet only one person in the whole of Acts is given this attribute. It's Barnabas. I just don't know where the church would be without this guy encouraging everyone. If we want to finish the work of Jesus, if we want to see him come, I think it's going to take a lot of Barnabas' encouraging people in ministry, right? Are you being called to be a Barnabas? Are you being called to see the potential in somebody else? I want to say, do you need a Barnabas? And I think we all do. But if we all need a Barnabas, it means we all need to be a Barnabas to somebody as well. Are you following? We all need to be able to encourage, to push people, to kind of get them excited. Come on, the work of Jesus is a great thing. You can do it. I believe in you. I have faith. I want to go back to verse 23 of Acts chapter 11, if you're following in your Bibles. It said, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them. This is the word that is used to describe him, Barnabas, ex a person of exhortation. He literally does the thing he's nicknamed for. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. In verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Powerful verses here. Last week we saw the content of what Peter shared in an evangelistic setting. He talked about that there's this message of peace. He said there was a king who's going to usher in that peace. And that this king was bringing a message of forgiveness and liberty from sins. This week, what we're seeing is what does it look like when we engage with people? What are the things we need to be doing with new converts? In verse 21, we see that this group of Greek Jews, the hand of the Lord is with them. And they start to, to reach out to, fellow, to, to these Greek speakers. And here's this phrase that you, Luke uses three times. Gentiles start to turn to the Lord. They start to turn to the Lord. And in verse 23, I just want you to see this. Um, when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord. All of this is to the Lord, right? These people have been reached. Now we've got these new converts. What, is, what does Barnabas encourage them to do? Stay faithful to the person of Jesus. It's as simple as that. Stay faithful to the person of Jesus. Remain in the person of Jesus. And what do we see the byproduct of that is? A great many people were added, what? To the Lord. Friends, the purpose of being a Christian is to walk with the Lord, and the purpose of evangelism is to direct people to the Lord. Okay? This is a quote from a man called Francis Schaeffer. In evangelism, we present Jesus as the central figure of our message. Amen? Amen. And we live out his teachings as the subject of our lives. He is both the reason for the witness and the model of our daily walk. Friends, anything short of Jesus all in ministry it is not evangelism as it should be. It's all about Jesus. It's all about following Jesus. Thank you. Where's Auxilia gone? I know where she is. But thank you for sharing about how this, this discipleship journey has been going in your life. It's all about how do we follow Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives? How do we make him real to us? Not just a person that we hear about on Saturday mornings, but how is he somebody that we're actively following and walking in his footsteps? Here's another quote from a theologian, John Stott. 
Evangelism is the proclamation of Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. He is both the subject of our message and the model of the Christian life. It's a both and, guys. You don't just get baptized because you heard great sermons about Jesus. You heard great sermons, and now the invitation is to walk in the walk, to walk in the way of Jesus. It's not just about hearing. We are called to make his life and teachings the center of our message and to live as he lived in the world. This is what I believe Barnabas was doing. But Barnabas realizes, I can't do this on my own. I, like, this is a big group of people. We're hearing this church is growing. And the language, a great many people were added to the Lord. Luke's very intentional here. There's a gr big group of people in this very cosmopolitan environment. Who are these people going to need to lead them to grow deep in their walk after Jesus? We're going to need a very unique person. Okay, somebody who knows, you know, the story of the Jews, but also somebody who's comfortable with rubbing shoulders with Gentiles. We're going to need somebody who understands the values and the customs of Antioch and the people who live here. We need somebody who can marry the story of God with the experience of these people. Who is going to be able to fit this role? Who is somebody who's going to be able to step into this? I can't do this. I grew up as a Levite. I'm a super religious pastor's kid. I can't speak to these guys as much as I'd love to. I need to find somebody to help me do this. You know what? I remember that weirdo Paul. Remember that weird guy Paul? Yeah, I remember that weird guy Paul. He was a bit wild, he was a bit crazy, he was a bit full on. We didn't know what to do with him in Jerusalem, but I invited him into my home. He's super passionate, but everybody just kind of, you know, after church in the foyer, they would just leave him to stand in the corner on his own. I actually think this guy, I talked to him a bit, he might be the guy. He might be the person who could actually make a difference in these new believers' lives. Yeah, he went to the desert. He spent time with Jesus. Okay, so what we see in verse 25 is the Bible simply says this. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. It's about 250 kilometers away. It's a decent walk there and back. For all this time, Paul's just been there. We think it could be anywhere from six to ten years. He's just been hanging out in Tarsus doing nothing. Friends, here's the point about Barnabas reaching Paul. There is no way known that I, myself, Ryan Vito, the pastor of Packham Church, I'm going to be able to do all of the things God needs to do to this community. Is that, is that obvious? It's kind of obvious, right? But often we just don't stop to think about it. It's going to take more than just a Ryan who is born in the Seychelles, grew up in a multicultural home, uh, is very ethnic, likes to eat rice with every meal. It's going to take more than Orion to reach out to the guys out there. Because the guys out there are very different to me. They're Australian, they're tradies, they're all sorts of things. They're teachers, they're plumbers, they're lawyers. I mean, I, I can kind of relate to them, but it's going to take more than me. I'm so glad we have a pastoral team here. We just have read the name of Matthew and his family Matthew is kicking goals with our youth in ways that I never could. This guy brings a wealth, I'm, I'm making you embarrassed right now. This guy brings a wealth of experience of working with youth in South Africa. And yeah, I've worked with youth, but this guy did some pretty cool stuff. Just, I, I, I need him. I need him to help the young people of our church. Anna, she does Bible studies with people that she can connect with that I can't. I need an Anna. I need, you know... For I need the craziness of Anna and Matthew to my normal. <laughs> Just like Barnabas needed a crazy Paul to his normal. And I know that sounds a bit rude, but I like to joke. <laughs> but guys, we need people who are different to us to help get the work done. This is John Maxwell, Christian leadership guru. To achieve success, you must be willing to recognize your deficiencies and surround yourself with people who are strong where you are weak. 
Building a strong team means embracing the strengths of others to complement your own. But here's the thing. So much of ministry is jealousy. I've told you this before. So many of us are so uncomfortable. We don't want another person to come and take our pulpit and preach. You can see I'm okay with that. I invite a lot of people in. But I mean, it was a thing I struggled with once upon a time. Like, you can't come and be the top dog. This is my place. Like, (coughs) a lot of people struggle with this. And here's what happens, John Maxwell says. When leaders fail to recognize their own deficiencies and don't build a team to address those gaps, they themselves are up for failure. Overestimating one's own abilities leads to missed opportunities and stagnant growth. Where in your life are people who need Jesus, but maybe you're not the right person, but there's somebody sitting across from you in church is? Have you thought about that? Some of my greatest joys in ministry are going, you know what? I think you're such a cool person, but I've got a person here that I think would really, really, really just get along with you so well. Walk with you well, talk with you well, talk your language, understand your culture, lead you to Christ. And some of my greatest joys is to see this happen in ministry. Can we lose our pride and be willing to allow other people to step in to do the work that God needs to do in that person's life? Can we take a piece of humble pie and be honest enough to know, I actually can't do it all? My neighbor who loves ACDC and plays music really loud, listens to the footy and swear, I can't reach them. I like them. (laughs) But it's going to take somebody else and not me. Can you see that? It takes all types. Now, I need you to imagine, though, meanwhile, you're Paul. You've been sent home. You went to Jerusalem so excited. You arrived at this church And everybody looked at you like you're a big weirdo. And they're like, thank you, that's really nice. We think you could be used back at your home. You go home, go. And we'll let you know if we need you. For six to ten years, you're just sitting there. Trying to share Jesus with your family. They probably think you're weird. We don't hear of Paul's family coming to faith in any significant way. He was a Pharisee. He probably was married. We don't hear of a wife later on. Did she divorce him? We just don't know. I suspect those six to ten years would have been very lonely and very dark for Paul. Have you been a place where you've just felt alone in church? We didn't have that support. I kind of wonder if Paul, you know, had moments where, God, like, what is the point? You did this super miraculous moment in my life where you showed up and you convicted me that I've been doing the wrong thing, and now I'm just sitting, wasting away. It takes a Barnabas to turn a person's life around like that, yeah? How many people need us to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you can do it? Again, John Stott, the theologian, Barnabas' role was not only that of an advocate, but also of a deep emotional supporter. His acceptance and endorsement of Paul during a time of isolation and suspicion provided Paul with the emotional fortitude needed to face the challenges of his ministry. Can you see that? There's this great book. I've wanted to basically read you the book, but it just talks about how Paul changed the world we live in. So many of the things we have in our world, the legal system, the justice system, caring for the poor, all of these things, we just don't have this without Paul's letters. And here we again see it takes a Barnabas to raise up a Paul. Here's what Sister White has to say. The members of the church need to be uplifted and encouraged through mutual support. Emotional encouragement is as crucial, she says, as spiritual guidance. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought that she was more than just about the end of the world, but also just as much about your spiritual, your, sorry, your emotional well-being? Emotional encouragement is as crucial as spiritual guidance as it strengthens and sustains individuals in their journey of faith. Let's continue in verse 26 of Acts 11. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch, And this pairing is so successful, we read, for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. 
Barnabas never goes back to give the report of how things were going. Did you notice that? They just stayed there for a year. Ministry is succeeding because we were able to bring in people to complement our weaknesses. Christianity starts to explode. They taught a great many people we read. And this is an echo of Acts chapter 2, where we see the, these new converts from Pentecost devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Luke wants you to know teaching is so crucial to the growth of the church. And it's here as a result of this explosive teaching in verse 26. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. This is more of a slur. Christians didn't call themselves Christians. They called themselves people of the way. We are people of the way of Jesus. The Jews would call them Nazarenes. It's a way of calling them Bogans. But they would call themselves people of the way. The people in New York City, in Antioch, call them Christians. Why? Because all they talk about is this Christos, this anointed one. They talk about this king. And you could see how serious they were about this message. And I wonder if bringing Paul in just poured rocket fuel onto this environment. And that's why they're able to get this name, which we carry to this day. It's always been about Jesus, but it took a Barnabas reaching to Paul to really make this thing explode. So at this point, this has taken a longer time. There was another part of my, I can't even go to the other part of the story where they give money to Jerusalem. But I just really wanted to pour into our people today the value of encouraging. We don't do this enough. You know and I know that we've all had talks over the lunch table or on the drive home where we said this about sister so-and-so and we didn't think the sermon was right how it should be and I don't mind if you think that. But I mean, how often do we actually go, man, we really, I, I just need to say an encouraging word to that person because they're doing such a great work. I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet here. Ever since Denise has left our church, you guys all know Denise, she still sends me encouraging messages, and it makes my day. I'm like, oh, thanks, Denise. Really needed that. You know how much it brought, ask Emma, I'm just kind of like, oh, Denise sent me a message. She's like, is there another woman in your life? It's Denise. <laughs> but guys, it really lights me up when, and, and I'm just like, I get it because I'm the pastor, but do you do this to each other? Do you encourage each other? Really need to think about this. I'm going to conclude now. There's one other lesson that I kind of see in all of this, and this is now from the, the bird's eye perspective. This might be a little bit controversial, but now we have, this, is, this bit's not controversial, but we have two epicenters of Christianity. We have Jerusalem, which is made up of Jewish Christians, and we also have the Antioch Church now, which is made up of primarily Gentiles. If I can say this, and I know it might ruffle some feathers, but I want you to prayerfully think about this. We have a more conservative expression of church and what it means to follow Jesus. And we have a more progressive form. And I know we all have thoughts on progressive and conservative people within our own denomination. But here's what I want to challenge you with. If the spirit of the living God is inside of people in these spaces, who am I to question what God is doing through them? I'm not saying we need to, 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 to accept everything that we disagree with on one side or the other. But if God is living and, and he's working inside of my brother over here, who am I to throw stones at him? If, if my sister over here loves to bash her tambourine and worship, we don't have that in our denomination, so I'm picking on another. My sister loves to bash her tambourine, but she is reaching people for Jesus. And, and, and like a Barnabas, I can see grace in her life. Who am I to throw stones at her? Please don't send me emails, well, you know, about this issue and that issue. I just want you to wrestle with this thought. You have two different churches and the book of Acts, we're going to get into it. It's about a contest between these two groups for the rest of the story. Because these two groups cannot get along, Paul is going to have to die He's going to have to go to Rome. You know the rest of the story. 
how does our story finish as a denomination when Jesus comes back? Are we going to be divided on the things that don't matter? Are we going to be united in the things that do? I'm not saying if there's a problem that you feels for real, sure. Like, we, we can't just accept it, bad theology. We can't just accept, you know, uh, uh, works of the flesh in our Christian walk. Like, there are things we just need to reject. But when we see Jesus working in people in different camps, how do we respond to that? Do we encourage? I don't know if we do. That's the thought I want to leave you with. I want to invite our music team up as we sing our final hymn. Our final hymn is Take My Life and Let It Be. And the challenge I want you to sing for as we sing this song.